Welcome, everyone, to worship. My name is Jill Williams. I am one of the pastors here at Covenant Prez, and if I have not met you, I sure am glad to welcome you. I'm glad to welcome you, whether you are here in the sanctuary or gathering with us through our live stream this morning. We are a community that is encouraging one another to follow Jesus wherever we live, work, and play, and it is good for us here at the end of a very difficult week to gather together as a community of faith. This morning, I would like to draw special attention to the announcements section on the back of your worship bulletin, drawing our attention particularly to the Lent small groups. You'll see there at the top, new groups are forming during Lent and will engage in a book study, Low Anthropology. You'll see there how you might uh, find out more information or join a small group. We sure do commend this to you. You also could call the church office if you're looking for more information. Friends, as we gather this morning, we do acknowledge, name together, that it has been a challenging week, one where we have endured and are still enduring a difficult ice storm and its aftermath including some of us still in homes without power. We are a people in need of encouragement and nourishment. As we ready our hearts for worship, hear words from Jesus. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let us worship the Lord. Would you stand now for the call to worship? Cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Come into God's presence with singing. For the Lord is a gracious God, whose mercy is everlasting. And whose faithfulness endures to all generations.
Please be seated. We cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes we make, and about how well or poorly we have treated one another. In this spirit, let us offer our prayers to God, first silently and then together, as printed in the bulletin, first silently. And together, God of the ages, we do not always wait with patience. We do not always recognize your work in our lives. We would rather take the credit for ourselves. We would rather take the easy way out. Forgive us for all the ways we forget you. Help us to delight to do your will. Help us to trust in you and return us to the path of righteousness. In your name we pray. Amen. Comfort in the assurance that even those things that are hidden from memory or are too deep for our words are not beyond God's forgiving love. God, who knows us completely, bestows pardon and peace. Thanks be to God. Christ has given his peace to us. Let us turn to one another and give the peace of Christ to them. May the peace of Christ be with you.
As we come before God with our tithes and offerings, let us remember the words of Micah 6. What does the Lord require of us? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Thus we bring our money, our gifts, and our whole lives as an offering to our God. Will the ushers please come forward? pray with me. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
Today we conclude our teaching series titled Questions. Each week we've spent time with a different question found in scripture and what these questions have to teach us, asking questions rather than telling you what's right and wrong and how to live. Questions are formative. Jesus used questions to shape and to form his people. We're beginning this year with questions intentionally instead of strategy and goals with the invitation to wrestle with these important questions this new year. Let me remind us of the journey we've been on. We began our journey with the question that God asked to Adam and Eve, where are you? It's difficult to have a sense of where you're going in life if you don't already have a sense of where you currently are. Where am I relationally? Where am I spiritually? Do you have a friend who loves you well enough to not let you hide when things are difficult? Where are you? The next week, we considered the perspective of the man, the ill man who had been ill for a very long time by the pool of Bethsaida, where our lives can be changed, who was asked by Jesus, do you want to be made well? Are we able to recognize ourselves by that pool in need of healing ourselves? Healing doesn't place, take place in one moment. It's a tapestry ongoing, and we have to be an active part of the process. What might you have to do to participate with God in God's ongoing work of healing in the world as he stirs the healing waters? Who do you say that I am? was the question asked of Peter by Jesus and is the most important question you will ever be asked to consider. Who do you say Jesus is? And do you really mean it? Remember that what we have in common is that we are all hopelessly broken. Knowing that you're not qualified is what makes you qualified. Last week, we considered the question, do you know what you are reading? Asked by Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch as he heard him reading the book of Isaiah as he was returning home in his chariot. It's important to recognize that we all need mentors and guides to attend to our lives and to trust that we are called qualified and that this is how the world changes. Who are you called to care for, to pray for? To mentor. Which brings us to today's question in scripture found at the beginning of John's gospel, an important question for us to sit in, reflect in, and wrestle with as a people who are on a journey of faith, a journey that involves moving with mystery occurring throughout. Our reading this morning from John's gospel, God's word for us this day. The next day, John, John the Baptist, again, was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translates, Translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may it all be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Speak to us, Lord. We are listening. May there be a fresh wind of the Spirit among us. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. 16th century German painter Matthias Grunewald, his painting Crucifixion was commissioned for the hospital chapel at St. Anthony's Monastery. You may remember this artwork from a couple of years ago. We included it in our holy attention devotional uh, during Lent, I think two years back. The care the medieval monks primarily devoted themselves was to treating patients who were afflicted with a terrible skin disease. 
You see in the painting Christ's mother being comforted by the beloved disciple, John himself, with Mary Magdalene kneeling in devotion. John the Baptist, the herald and forerunner of Jesus, is seen pointing to Jesus, the Lamb of God. The most shocking detail in the painting is that Grunewald portrays Christ as suffering with the same skin disease, a sign to the patients that Christ shared in their sufferings. As patients endured, or excuse me, entered the church hospital, they saw that Christ was not only taking on their sins upon him, but also their painful and deadly disease as well. Patients were known to sit before the painting to meditate as they suffered. This image of the crucified Christ communicated to those hurting in the 16th century that Jesus was hanging on the cross specifically for them. That same message is for us today, Christ on the cross for us. Influential theologian Karl Barth had a copy of Grunewald's crucifixion over his desk, hovering over him on the wall of his study where he worked relentlessly. Every morning before he would teach theology or write, Bart would meditate on this painting, particularly taken by how John the Baptist is portrayed. He said that as Christians, whether you are a theologian, a teacher, a parent, a business owner, a lawyer, a medical professional, a student, whatever your vocation and calling might be, our job is to be the pointing finger of John the Baptist. Bart said that the scene painted by Grunewald is the sum of all history, from creation in the past to eternity. He said that we are the pointed indexed finger. In doing so, Bart understood his calling, the purpose of his life, and he also understood, as some who got a lot of attention, that he himself was not the Messiah. In John's gospel, we find John teaching two of his own disciples when Jesus walked by. In a moment of beautiful humility, John told his disciples that the Lamb of God was passing by the Messiah implying that they should leave his side and follow Jesus instead, which is exactly what the two in today's passage did. It isn't long before Jesus notices their interest. He stops, turn, and turns and asks them a wonderful open-ended question. The first words of Jesus in the Gospel of John, what are you looking for? Deliver a question and frame a world. It is a deliberate question. It will raise those who hear it to a world and to a communion that only Jesus can form with them. What is drawing you? What do you really want? This question of Jesus attempts to bring to the surface the desires that are actually governing human life. What do you most deeply desire? For some of us this morning, the question so easily is power. Is it peace in your home? Financial security? A sense of purpose to your work or to your broader life? Help and care for children and people who are particularly vulnerable and at risk? A cure for cancer? heart disease, Alzheimer's, a good friend, someone to love. Maybe you're most of all looking just simply to catch a break. This question throws the two disciples back upon themselves. What is the mystery that draws them? What actually has value for them? What has made them decide on this direction rather than on another? The question guides them to come to a profound awareness of themselves and to understand themselves and their own desires to know who they are and who they are to become. It seems like the disciples who hear the question simply dodge it. 
Perhaps like us, they aren't sure what to say. Instead, they ask Jesus, where are you staying? If John the Baptist had heard the disciples' question, he might have given them a disappointment speech for not getting it. But that is not the Jesus way. Instead of correcting or condemning, Jesus gives a simple, simple yet profound response. His response to them, come and see. Jesus gives an invitation that is more than an invitation. Jesus grabs us and pulls us close. Jesus pulls us into the story of the new thing that God is doing in God's world and in our lives. Jesus' response seems elusive and concrete all at once. Come and see, which is to say we have to follow Jesus all the way home if we want to know where he is and what he is all about. He won't be pinned down. He's always on the move, so the path that leads to him will only become clear when we decide to walk it. We have to experience it. This always happens best in community. Always happens best in community. Community is absolutely essential. The question is not to be answered just once, but over and over again. This is the heart of discipleship, not to rest to the end of, the end of our search, but to pursue it ever more deeply and intentionally to come and to see and to enter into the joy of being deeply seen and deeply known. I've been thinking again this week, this particular week, of Eugene Peterson's reflections about life in the middle. Peterson writes that people who live by faith have a particularly acute sense of life in the middle. We believe that God is at the beginning of all things, and we believe that God is at the conclusion of all life. It is routine among us to assume that the beginning was good. In the beginning, God creates. God then looks out on all that he has created and says that it is very good. It is agreed among us that the conclusion will be good. At the end of God's story, we learn that there will be a new heaven and a new earth, the day when God makes everything right, the day when everything sad becomes untrue. That would seem to guarantee that everything in between, the good beginning and the glorious ending would also be good but it does not always turn out that way, or at least not in the ways that we expect. That always comes as a surprise. We expect uninterrupted goodness, and it is interrupted. I am unnoticed by a parent, divorced by a spouse, bullied by a classmate, discriminated by a society, injured by another's carelessness. Between the two, there are hard times, personal trials, disappointments, challenging weather events, and unable to be explained absurdities, each one of them a reversal of expectation. Life in the middle can be difficult. We have been reminded of that this week as we faced power outages and down trees with thousands still without power after a debilitating ice storm, schedules and plans have been uprooted, work interrupted and kids out of school unexpectedly. It's been a tough week. I wonder how you are doing. I wish we had time to talk about that with one another. I sure encourage you to do so with someone from this community. I confess to feeling more discouraged this week than I remember feeling for a very long time. This is a part of our life together. We accompany one another in the middle, facing the ugly details and the meaningless routines, all the while stubbornly insisting that this unlovely middle is somehow connected to a grand beginning and a glorious ending. 
The truth of the gospel is verified in life in the middle. Can't always make sense of our lives. We can't always make sense of the world, for we see only in part. It needs to be put together by the author of the story, by the one who holds all things together in the middle. When we see in part and walk by faith, a primary work we do is to point one another to Jesus, the source of our strength and the hope of our lives as a people sent to each other and sent to the world. Does your life seem to be focused on looking for a life and calling from Jesus? Or are you more distracted by other questions that give your life direction and focus? What are you looking for? A life of discipleship begins with that question. For those who understand, they are sent. This question is where the disciples' lives are changed. When Christ is central, our faith finds its focus. Yesterday afternoon, two covenant friends dropped by unannounced to help me with tree debris in my yard. I was very touched. I continue to be touched by their love and generosity and was confronted again with how challenging it can be to receive. I was headed out the door actually to go to a coffee shop. Uh, I'm still one of those looking for power. As they arrived and wondered if we could all work together today instead of yesterday because I needed to go and to do some work. But they requested that I not deny them the opportunity to live into their calling as a people who understand that they are sent. <laughs> I asked them then to please only tend to the big branch in my front yard and leave what's in the backyard for me today. In fact, I didn't even show them the backyard. I needed them to say yes, actually, so that I could go and not feel guilty for leaving my friends in my yard working without me. Well, as you guessed it, they totally ignored my request. And I came home to a massive mound, a giant pile of trimmed and stacked branches in a beautiful backyard. Apparently neighbors joined in, hamburgers were shared, it was a whole event. Those two were that pointed indexed finger. As they pointed to Jesus, who loves sacrificially and generously. We point to Jesus in ways great and small, a blessing spoken or enacted can point to Jesus, a prayer of hope can point to Jesus, an identification with the pain of the world can point to Jesus, all of it an expression of love. Friends, we hope that you will continue to pay attention to questions found in Scripture as a way to be shaped and to form. These questions are an invitation to reflect on your journey and your ongoing walk with the Lord. As you do, remember that Scripture is not just a text to be studied. It is a living word. Consider each question as a question that God is asking you. Our answers can change because our lives change. We hope the questions found in scripture continue to open up wonderful conversations and a deeper connection between you and God. Soon we will gather at the Lord's table in communion with Christ, mindful of brothers and sisters near and far. If we come to the table with a hungry heart, Jesus promises that we will be satisfied. This is not just for our comfort, it is for the good of the world. We remember all who suffer. We give thanks for companions for the journey, for those who point us to Jesus, our friends who follow in the life-giving way of Jesus and encourage us. We receive the grace poured out for us. This meal is an invitation to a longing, a belonging, a mission.
Come, all who hunger and thirst, and you shall be filled. What are you looking for? Jesus says, come and you will see. Let's pray. Holy God, how grateful we are for mercy that is new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. As we thank you as well that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, would you open our eyes to those who need our support and encouragement and help. Nourish us, we pray, with hopeful expectation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. seated. The feast of communion is prepared for you. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. All are welcome at this table. Let us pray. Eternal living God, we come to you and to this table to worship you for who you are your holy character, your loving mercies, your presence in our lives. As Heavenly Father, you are above us in Jesus Christ, your Son, who became flesh and lived among us. And by the Holy Spirit, you are within us. You are the great God of our salvation, our good Heavenly Father. You are greatly to be praised. We belong to you, we bless you. We come humbly to this table. We come seeking your mercy and grace. For you've done so much for us through your son, Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection. Help us, Lord, as we have just heard from Jill, to truly know that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away our sin, who invites us to come and see who invites us to repent of our sins, who invites us to believe the good news of God's grace, and invites us to follow him as Lord of our lives and to point to Jesus. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for reaching out for us. Thank you for that your acceptance of us isn't dependent on the profundity of our thoughts. It's not dependent on the goodness of our lives, but on your marvelous love and your forgiving grace. It's by your grace we gather at this table to enjoy your presence and the presence of fellow believers, to celebrate with praise and gratitude that Jesus Christ is crucified and risen. And Lord, thank you for your giftedness in giving Christ, and thank you for all the blessings you pour out on us day after day, blessing us beyond our ability to even take it all in. I do pray, Lord, as we come to this table, I pray for those who find it hard 
today to rejoice. Maybe a house without power, some discouragement that won't lift, chronic pain that won't go away, something that's burdening the spirit day after day. Lord, renew in all of us a calm assurance that you are always with us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who Jesus sent to comfort us and fill us with love, joy, and peace. We live with confidence knowing that in all the circumstances of our lives, in that middle way, you are at work for good. We pray not only for ourselves, but for our nation and our world. Strengthen those in governing authority. Give them wisdom. Help them govern for the common good. Thank you for the privileges your church in a hurting world to be instruments of your peace and grace. Help each of us, Lord, to live each day in such a way that our neighbors, our co-workers, our children and friends can see Jesus in ways that they haven't seen him before. May all that we say and do echo the good news of your love and grace. We want to be more like Jesus. We want to be more like Jesus. We want the Holy Spirit so at work in us that the world around us becomes a better place with more peace and truth and kindness. So now we ask, gracious Lord, that you hallow and sanctify these holy gifts of bread and cup that we may eat and drink of your beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may receive his body and blood and that he may live in us and we as his body, the church, may live in him. We're a needy people. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. So make this a feast of grace as we remember his atoning death and share in his mighty resurrection and his promise that he's coming again. We gratefully and humbly pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, and after he gave thanks to God, broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. For every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim something. We proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes again. And come again he shall to make all things right. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us eat and drink and be nourished together. I would invite the servers to come forward.
am the resurrection. I am the life. If you believe in me, even though Yes, Lord, we believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And Let us pray. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, we praise you for your love. We thank you for your grace. You give bread to the hungry. You give drink to the thirsty. You raise us to new life. Thank you, Lord. 
You are the word made flesh, the light of the world, the bread of heaven, the cup of salvation. You are the resurrection and the life. Holy Spirit, through this bread we've shared and through this cup we've shared. So come and live in us. For by the body and blood of Christ, we are one body. We are one in ministry, one in service, in this place and in this world and in the world to come. To you, O Lord, be all blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power, forever and ever. We offer this thanks and praise as we join in singing together the prayer the Lord taught us. go to be God's hope-filled people, following and serving and pointing to Jesus all your days. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and with those you love. Amen. <laughs>